As we digest this question of how do I tell timelessness, perhaps the most important question in the world today that you almost never hear anyone talking about, as we digest that question, the answer is in fact the same way human beings have always practiced and exercised telling timelessness, and that is through engaging our second highest function. And you may be asking yourself, well, what is our second highest function? And that is through art, through music, through dance, through myth, through story, through literature, through rite, through symbol. That is our second highest function as human beings. Why? Because our second highest function as human beings allows us to be in a position, potentially, to connect with our highest function. As we have the opportunity, potentially, to encounter the absolute, to encounter the infinite, to encounter timelessness. And it is art, it is myth that delivers us there. And let's be very clear that popular culture today is not very clear about this myth stuff because we all know that myth is a lie, right? Turn on any TV, it'll tell you quickly. The opposite is the case. No more is myth a lie than a great piece of poetry is a lie or a great concert or an extraordinary dance performance. Because this art, this myth, has the capacity to take us somewhere else, to transport us to a place where we have the possibility of connecting with the ultimate. Great art, great poetry, great myth, great literature has the possibility of being transparent to that which is infinite. And it is that encounter and the awe that you and I experience in that encounter that is our highest function. Now, you may say, well, not all art does that for me. That's right, because there are two types of art. There's crummy art, and there's great art. And great art, great myth, takes us to that place. There are no guarantees, but it takes us there, and the possibility of that connection exists. Crummy art, crummy music, bad movies, all point to themselves. Hey, look, look at me. Look at me. Look at me. That's what crummy art does. Great art gets us to look beyond, through the art, to a deeper place. Sometimes we're asked, where'd you get this material? And I'll be truthful, it's all stolen. It's all stolen. It's stolen material, but it's stolen from some really great places. And it's stolen from some great places and some great people that you mostly know about. And the reason why you don't recognize sometimes what's happening here is because we human beings are so expert 
in taking the encounter with ultimate reality, with truth with a big T, and we are expert at very quickly converting that into human-centered illusion, which is more comfortable. It um, feels good, but it's illusion. The great teacher who walked out of the desert, the great teacher who sat under the tree, the great teacher who stood in the river, uh, the great teacher who came down the mountain, uh, the great teacher who came out of the cave. Each of those masters had an encounter. They had an encounter with the unspeakable. They had an encounter with pure, raw being. And that encounter was unspeakable, but guess what? When we have that encounter, we gotta go tell somebody. They had to go tell somebody. They had to, you can't tell anybody. They had to go tell somebody. You can't tell anybody, it's unspeakable. And so each of those great masters, and I, I, can, I can hear some of you now saying, weren't those all guys? <laughs> and for about a thousand different, not very good reasons, yes, they, they were all guys. And part of why some of you are sitting here today is because the world today needs to hear this message again needs to encounter this message again. And the world needs to encounter that message in a feminine voice. And today is maybe your day to figure out how that begins to happen. So each of these great teachers had an encounter that they had to share. And to do so, they had to create a myth. They had to create a story. They had to try to communicate some art that people could look through to connect with that which they had connected with. So Amanda knew she had to climb the mountain. She didn't necessarily know why she had to climb, she just, she had to climb the mountain. She was compelled to climb the mountain. She no more knew why she had to climb the mountain than some of us understand why we keep showing up here. Amanda had to climb, she climbed the mountain. Amanda knew she had to personally, solitarily explore the peak of being. She went up the mountain. She encountered raw, pure being. And on her way down the mountain, her eyes were full of fire, her hands were full of fire. She was ecstatic. She was full of mystery and awe. And she couldn't speak, she was dumbstruck. She couldn't even talk to herself about her encounter with the unspeakable. She could not grasp the one who cannot be grasped, but she was totally grasped by that experience. Amanda came down the mountain and there, at the bottom of the mountain, were her friends and some of her followers. 
They say, hey, hey Amanda, Amanda, uh, uh, Amanda, uh, what, what happened up there? Well, Amanda just sort of looked right through them. Like they weren't there. Hey, Amanda, uh, uh, what what'd you see up there? Well, after some uncomfortable moments, Amanda was compelled to say something. So she she told them a story. She gave them a little a little myth and tried to communicate with her friends and followers in um, and one or two of them, the good students, they sort of got it. They sort of got this story, this myth is compelling me to, I got to go climb the mountain, to encounter the peak of being myself. But most of them were just really happy now because they had a story. They had a story and they were, they were happy and they took that, that story, that art, that something real, and this is something to believe in. This is, I'm done now. And in fact, these are the ones, as is the case, uh, that ran back to the village to then begin uh, ordering everything based on their interpretations of the story that Amanda had told them when she got off the mountain, not having a clue that it pointed to something deeper. And you know what? This gets repeated and repeated again and again and again and again and again and again in human history as it's being repeated today. And we will not transform this world until there is a revolution in consciousness from refunctioning our highest function, which can then feed our second highest function, which then can allow our third highest function, which is the exercise of politics and economics and how we manage the environment of this planet and human morality and education there will not be a revolution, a transformation of our third highest function until the other two happen. So why do we do this program? Why do you keep showing up? We're here to start a fire in the library. <laughs> We're here to start a fire in me and in you in such a way that we each today begin our own dialogue with ultimate reality. Our own, we begin to practice, to exercise our own engagement with the one with whom we are inescapably entangled forever. And as that begins to happen consciously, there is nothing that can't be transformed. But without that, then we are forever caught in a swamp of ego-centered, self-serving, human personality and illusion from which we will not find our way until we reactivate our highest functions. I would like all of the blind people in the room, and if you're not certain if you're blind, go ahead and hold out your right hand in front of you. Go ahead. This is not a trick. And then for just a moment, 
close your eyes as we prepare to touch the elephant.